Good afternoon, everybody. So inspired today, you have myself and my CFO, Paul Connor. Paul Connor um, voted one of the uh, finance directors <coughs> top 35, under 35. We think he lied about his age. Um, he looks much older than that. But ultimately, um, Paul's here to do any different questions on finances, and I'll walk you through the <coughs> business and what it does. Um, I guess from my side, uh, I've been in the energy space since I was a, a young man in my 20s. I bootstrapped a business when I was 28, and so that's private equity 10 years later. I guess I was um, quite uh, pleased to be uh, made chief executive of the business that bought us um, when I kind of um, learned about multiple arbitrage and buy and build under private equity. I um, built a business called the MC Energy Group um, through a, a globalization thesis, uh, exited that to Schneider Electric in 2012 on 2.8 times money over a two and a half year burn in 2012 market conditions. So I guess this isn't my first rodeo. Uh, this is my first capital markets experience, which I'm really enjoying apart from my share price. The rest of it's all really, really good. Um, so what's the journey we've been on? First name in 2011, never missed a forecast. It's a six to 8% organic growth engine with a market consolidation thesis. In the last three years, so if you go back to FY16, we were about 21.5 million revenue, 8.3 million EBITDA. FY19 consensus, December year end, 48.5 million revenue, 90 per EBITDA. And the most important thing is we generate cash, high cash conversion and kind of cash generation. FY20 consensus, 58.4 million, 23.2 million EBITDA. And ultimately, that's really just doing or running the machine as it runs now. There's nothing special or exceptional in there, which I'll um, take you through later on some of the upsides we have. As a stock, dividend paying, um, progressive kind of policy in line with earning per share, um, running at around about a 4.5% yield at the moment. What do we do? So as a business, we provide energy services, um, advisory services to energy consumers. There's two types of energy consumer in the marketplace. There's the corporate side of the market on the left-hand side, 1.2 million meters. And there's a SME market on the right-hand side, 2.18 million meters. What's great about that is every business in the country is a potential customer. It makes markets in them really easy. Every business in the country must have an energy supply contract. It's not a choice, you've got to have one. So we've got a repeatable, non-discretionary call to action. That's really valuable, happens every two, three years, drives recurring revenues. There was a load of academics put in a room in the 80s um, to work out how to make a competitive energy market. And as academics sometimes do, they made the rules really complicated. So if you're a business like Travis Perkins, for example, building supplies company with 1,400 sites in the UK, it is not trivial to be able to get an energy supply contract, to be able to compare the offers, to negotiate the terms, to actually change supplier. You need subject matter expertise. And the majority of businesses in this market don't have the expertise internally. They outsource that to companies like us. So we've got great drivers. Every business is a customer, potential customer. We've got a non-discretionary recurring call to action and we solve complexity. How do we do that? First product, making sure that we do the supply contract for them. So match the supplier to the customer, negotiate the terms, transfer the supply, make sure everything runs smoothly. The best thing about it is that kind of that gives us long-term contracts and high contracted earnings visibility. So effectively, I'm looking forward with an order book that runs over the next three years of in excess of 50 million pounds. And ultimately, if we close the doors tomorrow, that money would still come in. The next great thing about it is that you get the energy supply contract, you solve that complexity once, and the very next month, an invoice arrives. So if you're Travis Perkins, actually 4,200 invoices arrive. And those 4,200 invoices need checking. And someone's going to decide whether you should pay them or not. So our services, instead of those invoices going to Travis Perkins, they come to us. We digitize them. We store the tax records. We check them. We work out if there's any queries on them. We resolve those queries. And ultimately, we, the result is an AP file, accounts payable file, squirted into um, Travis Perkins' accounting system so they don't have to do any of that process. Now, what's wonderful about that is we've dealt with the procurement department. Now we're dealing with the finance department, often at CFO level. 
Once we're processing and validating that um, accounting function, we then get involved with setting the budgets. What should my budget be next year? If energy invoices arrive around about M plus 15, businesses need to close their accounts M plus one, M plus two. What should the accrual be? We sit there, we calculate the accrual. So now we start to have um, wide influence across the, um, the company. It's significant data management. So we're an advisory business that provides insights to the consumer and resolves complexity for them, but based on data management and data collection and data processing. So we're processing several million pieces of data a month on behalf of all these customers. Again, that requires robust systems, it requires expertise, it makes the customer um, sticky and gives us high client retention rates. The next great driver about this space, apart from that everyone needs a supply contract, everyone's a potential customer, solve complexity, is there's a statutory and regulatory driver. So ultimately, when you look at all of the environmental compliance reporting that businesses have to do, the latest one is the Streamlined Energy and Carbon Reporting Directive, which is an FD obligation for UK um, financial directors. The same data that is required to perform the energy accounting service is used to um, produce all of these emission reports and sustainability reports and those sort of things. So businesses like Travis Perkins don't go and build that capability in-house, they outsource it to us. Again, another non-discretionary call to action. Strong legacy drivers, we like those a lot. What's the final piece of the jigsaw? Once we're looking after the customer's price side of the equation, which is really the top three products, we're helping them manage the price of their energy cost equation. The other side of that cost equation is consumption. Now the consumption side, if you can reduce your consumption as a business consumer, you become more competitive. It helps the rest of your business. Energy is the largest indirect cost that most businesses have. And if you have volatility within a year, it flows straight to the bottom line. So managing it is a really important part of their competitive drivers. Also, I guess in the marketplace at the moment, a few of you have been heard about net zero carbon. So net zero carbon is the latest thing that really plays to the optimization space. What net zero carbon says is that basically uh, by 2050, we all have to be zero carbon. What's not clear, or what people don't really know, is that there's a Moyle's law effect. So ultimately, you don't get there by suddenly miraculously waiting until 2050. You have to halve carbon emissions literally 50% in the next 10 years, 50% the 10 years after that, and 50% the 10 years after that. And if you don't put in place the things to achieve 50% reduction in this decade by 2023, you will not get there. 630 global businesses have signed up to do this. And what you'll start to find is those businesses will push those drivers through their value chain, which will force business consumers to actually address these issues. So we start off with a really set of strong drivers on the price side, and now we're seeing the, the climate change agenda pushing that on the consumption side. To try and bring that to life to you, why it's so important and, um, to do and where our role comes, um, when I was doing the MNC Energy Group, the private equity play with the exit to Schneider, why did Schneider Electric buy the MNC Energy Group? Well, basically, we had a, a common customer. Common customer was British Telecom. British Telecom, um, I think, spent £30 million a year with Schneider Electric. And they spent £100,000 a year with me at the MNC Energy Group. Schneider Electric got to speak to the junior buyer at British Telecom because they were buying £30 million worth of widgets. At the MNC Energy Group, we were managing their quarter of a billion pound energy spend that had the potential to create something like a £200 million cost shock in the bottom line within a year. So I got to sit with the CFO every month. And when you have that relationship as a trusted advisor, it's much easier to actually help drive the consumption side of the equation with a client. So we've got a product and a business which has got some really good drivers, um, regulatory, non-discretionary calls to action, and ultimately it gives me a lot of earnings visibility. All the work we are doing within Inspired Energy today is really for next year's results. Ultimately, our work for this year is pretty much done. What's the size of the opportunity? Ultimately, the way to understand this marketplace is two sides, of SME and corporate. Um, and it's important at this stage just to differentiate between some of the things that have happened on the A market with this space. 
So I guess everyone in this room might be aware of utility-wise. All heard of that. So ultimately, utility-wise, they had 93% of their business in the pink area and 7% in the blue area. Inspired has 90% of its business in the blue area and 10% in the pink area. So we work in the corporate space. Utility-wise works in the SME space. The SME space isn't bad. Utility-wise was just perhaps a bad execution. The reason why we have a SME business is that some of our corporate customers have SME portfolios. We don't want to allow another company to provide service to our customers' energy, so it's defensive from our point of view. So the first thing to know is that actually we are 90% in the blue area, and that kind of operation means that we're dealing with high quality, large organizations that have a large number of, um, of meter points. It's interesting to note that the only part of utility-wise I'm aware of that was sold as a going concern was their 7% bit in the blue area. So that's the only bit that actually survived. What's the key takeaway? This is effectively a 1.2 billion pound market opportunity. This market opportunity, 400 million of it, is in the price side of the equation where we're in our core services. And in that price side of the equation where you're doing the procurement, you're doing the energy accounting, and you're doing the compliance services, that part of it, three out of every four businesses in the UK market use the services of a company like ours. So it's mature. What's great about that maturity is it's mature, but it's highly fragmented. And it's highly fragmented by some mom and pops. And that mom and pops means I actually get a, um, a flight to quality over time, where as customers become more sophisticated, they naturally converge to the larger players in the market of which we are the player of scale. So although I've only got a 10% market share, I'm twice as big as my nearest competitor. And what that plays to is actually the fact there is still a really good buy and build opportunity in this space. So 9% in the corporate market, 1.2 billion opportunity. It's highly fragmented. Another thing to note in this space is historic valuations. So there hasn't been a business within this space with more than 5 million EBITDA, to my knowledge, that has ever sold for less than 10 times EBITDA multiple. And you can go and research them. So you want to go and research MNC Energy into Snyder Electric. You want to go and research Utilix into Mighty, Power Efficiency into Balfour BT, Energy Quote into Accenture. If you go and research all those, you'll see where the traditional valuations are in this space. And even in the SME side, um, currently, more recently, um, Make It Cheaper, bought by ECI, Love Energy with um, Lloyd's Development Capital um, taking a stake there. So this is a good space with a good opportunity, um, and ultimately that's driven by a good organic growth engine, but also the opportunity to operate a disciplined buy and build strategy. What's the competitive landscape like? We're the player of scale. We're number one in the market, and when we bought Improva, the one down there at number nine, we made it impossible for any business in the space to do one transaction and become the largest player in the market. So nobody can usurp us as that number one player. Being the player of scale helps because one, you get the flight to quality, two, you can actually really capitalize on your operational leverage. The fragmentation of this space means that effectively uh, there's a consolidation place to do and we have the benefits of an aging entrepreneur base. Most of the entrepreneurs in this market are getting to a point where they're naturally seeking an exit. So the roll-up strategy, as long as it's in a disciplined way, um, makes a lot of sense. What are the valuations like? If I was going to go and buy a business with less than half a million pounds EBITDA, I'll be buying that at three to four times multiple. If they've got half a million to one and a half, I'll be buying it at five to six times multiple. If it's one and a half to five, seven to eight, as I say, business over five, normally a 10 times multiple. So ultimately, there's a great multiple arbitrage in the space and the ability to consolidate um, more quickly um, than just um, relying on organic growth alone. So what's our growth strategy? If you were to visit our offices and you spoke to anybody in our offices, they should be able to tell you they're responsible for one of three things. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors in this sector and people tend to overcomplicate the businesses. They're really quite simple businesses. The first thing, is I've got people focused on increasing total contract value. 
because revenues flow so far in the future, can we recognise revenue of the life of the contract, which plays to our order book metric, asking my staff to kind of be targeted on revenue doesn't make any sense because it's too far away from their activity. So what we focus them on is total contract value. And the way to think about this is um, in this space, there's 1.2 million metres in the corporate side on the left. And effectively, we have 149,000 of those um, on our core services of energy procurement, energy accounting and compliance. However, through Systems Link, my software solutions division, I have a transactional relationship with 350,000 metres in that marketplace. So I have a transactional relationship with 30% of them. So the role for my staff is to increase the number of units of opportunity we deal with, convert them to core service, so 149,000 from the 350. As we do that, we, we learn from that meter point what other services they can take from us. We call that our white space. So they then quantify the white space associated with that opportunity, increase the white space bank, and then finally they colour it in. And I've got 220 people pointed at doing that day in, day out, out of a 550 workforce. So the first driver for our growth is making sure that we actually uh, maximise the total contract value placed on the board each month. And year on year, I'm running up across the divisions around about 25% up on that. Noting that doesn't mean revenues go up by 25%, that takes time to flow through, but the contract value, the, the speed the machine is turning at, is up 25% year on year. The next level for us is you would go into our organisation and you could um, point to somebody who delivers our operations, our energy accounting services, our data management, the people who process all the consumption data, and their objective is to reduce labour cost per metre. So ultimately we do that in two ways. First one is roll, roll out of robotic process automation. We selected automation anywhere. You could have sat there and selected any other one, but we have a team of people going through the organisation actually making sure we replace administrative tasks where we can with kind of actually the, the new kind of AI technologies that can do that. Um, ultimately, so far, we've identified around about 20% of the operational labour that can actually be um, dealt with in that way. And I've got 131 people pointed at that kind of operational process. Where we can't automate it, we actually have an outsource centre in Mumbai where we provide administration services we, they don't talk to customers, they don't talk to suppliers. What they do is they free up the time of my experience resource in the UK to spend more time communicating with the customer. So those are the levers we pull for reducing um, cost per meter. The third group of people you could point to in the organisation is effectively um, the ones who deploy capex per meter. So the way to think about this is of my 149,000 meters that I've got in the corporate space, they're like my coffee shops. It's kind of, if you don't invest in your coffee shop, eventually a new cooler coffee shop comes along and you start going there, you don't go to the old one. So it would be naive for us to think that we could just continue to grow and continue to maintain our margins without repetitive investment. So what we therefore do is deploy CapEx to build cooler software solutions for the services that we deploy at the meter point. That allows us to continue to remain relevant, avoid disruptors, and to be in a place where ultimately we can maintain margins. Final part of the strategy, effectively four to five acquisitions per year. So we as a machine, we've proven that we can process, integrate successfully, um, effectively four to five acquisitions a year. You would note that Improva was our largest acquisition that we did in December 18. And ultimately, that was, we acquired about 2.7, 2.8 million of EBITDA on a 6.7 uh, multiple. We guided the city to 600,000 of synergies. Um, we outperformed that um, within the first six months. Ultimately, um, what we find is that for any acquisition we do, um, I gave you a guide to multiples before, we will normally take one to two points off that multiple through the integration process via release of synergies, which again, builds operational leverage to continue to improve your, your service. So that's kind of how we kind of drive the growth strategy. And I'd like to talk in detail about the Ignite investment we recently made. So anybody who follows us will know we actually um, entered into what was a fairly unique transaction in the marketplace. We made a strategic investment of, uh, in Ignite of so five million pounds for 40%. 
Um, now, the thing to take away about Ignite is that they basically have um, revenues of 12 million, EBITDA of three, but they get that from 10 customers. And I've got 500 customers that are the same as their size and shape. So what do Ignite do? Ignite do the same as Inspired from an energy accounting and procurement point of view, but they do it purely for the purposes of finding optimization solutions. So they are really very creative at finding ways to help customers reduce energy. And a great way to bring that to life is WH Smiths, if you went back five, six years, one of Ignite's early customers, and Ignite were doing the procurement and energy accounting and then identified loads of cost savings for WH Smiths across their estate. And WH Smiths wouldn't really do anything about it. So Ignite said, look, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're so frustrated. We're going to spend £40,000 of our money fixing this shop. The only thing you've got to do is get your CEO to come down and visit and have a look at it. So WH Smiths did this. They fixed the shop. And a few weeks later, Kate Swan turned up and said, let's have a look at the store. And she got it. She got it, she looked at it, she rolled it out across the portfolio, and over the last five years, they've created 3.8 million pounds in recurring cost savings for um, WH Smith in terms of energy efficiency. Now, Kate Swan, reputation for improving margins wherever she goes, she took them to SSP, delivering another one and a half million. We're hoping she turns up somewhere soon and they can kind of like continue going again. The key thing here, as I mentioned, is that when we look at that, They've done that with 10 customers. We've got 500 that are like that. Of the top 50 that they've analyzed of ours, um, we've identified a pipeline of between 50 to 100 million pounds of opportunity, depending on how optimistic you are. The way the deal works is that they can only look at five of our customers at a time. The reason why we do that is so they can't just rampage through the customers and upset them all, um, but also be in a place where, to be honest, if they took on three of our clients, they'd have 30% growth in that business pretty much straight away. So we have to kind of make sure it grows at a, a pace, but we're very excited about that. And in terms of the size of the opportunity, the best way to quantify it for you is that my 149,000 meters, I currently make 220 pound a meter. Ignite make 840 pounds a meter from their estate. And this all plays to reducing consumption and delivering the net zero carbon um, opportunity. When you look at our numbers, none of the actual um, benefit of any of this cross-sell is in any of our market forecasts. So what is the opportunity here? We've got a proven business, 6 to 8% organic growth, never missed a forecast, plus a portfolio of potential upsides. Disciplined M&A, to take advantage of a highly fragmented market, 16 transactions done so far but integrated effectively, integrated pragmatically. Also, you'll note that we recently announced our new finance facility, uh, where we've um, now got a, an increased facility of 60 million pounds from 35 with um, Santander and Bank of Ireland to give ourselves more firepower to continue with the acquisition strategy. However, you will also note that we don't go above two to two and a half times EBITDA um, to debt ratio on the way into a transaction, and we normalize out per synergies between one and one and a half times. And again, we've been very structured at never over leveraging the company. So this is a machine that can quite easily swallow four to five a year. We have a pipeline of acquisition opportunities out to 2024. And ultimately, that provides uh, the acceleration on top of the underlying 6 to 8% organic growth engine. A sector where historically, valuations have been 10 times EBITDA. I think I'm currently rated somewhere close to 7.7. But also, in those numbers which flow through, so 58, as long as I don't break anything, um, the 58 million FY20 is the business as it should, that's where the market's seeing the consensus. Um, no assumed M&A in those numbers. There is no assumed M&A in those consensus numbers. There is no assumed cross-sell from Ignite in those consensus numbers. And there is no benefit from robotic process automation or any of the operational leverage capability in those numbers. So ultimately, gentlemen, that's inspired.